We've come a long way. The internet, smartphones, self-driving cars, drones, social networks. We have better medical knowledge than ever before, more access to information than any other time in history. We can fly to the other side of the world in a matter of hours. We progress and evolve and create new technological wonders. But not everything new is progress. Not everything forgotten irrelevant. There are some things worth remembering. I want to give you a little update before we jump into the Forgotten Art series, because uh, many of you have been asking me, how are you doing, Pastor? How are you doing? And if you weren't here last week or two weeks ago and don't know my little progression, here's kind of my, my story in a short version. Uh, I seem to get sick about every 12 to 15 years or so. I've never, I've never missed a Sunday preaching at Shoreline in the 13 years I've been here. But a uh, week, couple weeks ago, I got what I thought was... Uh, nasal drip and burning in my throat from allergies, and uh, so I was, I had allergies for a few days, and then came here and preached, and then had a doctor friend of mine say, you should go get checked for COVID, and I said, well, I got a good immune system, I got double vaccination when it came out, and I feel fine, I just think I have allergies, he says, you should go check, and I went and checked, and they said, you're positive for COVID, and so I locked myself away for a bit, and, uh, and worked from home, but I didn't, I felt like I had allergies, so I didn't really, and I know some people have had very significant challenges with COVID, but in my case, it just was, it was kind of a non-event, but thank you for your prayers, and I'm allowed back out, and I'm allowed to be preaching. I actually, they said, don't, they actually called me, it was really sweet, the county called me, and they said, on my phone, it said, you know, COVID team or whatever, and I answered, and they said, um, how are you doing? I said, fine, they said, can we bring you any food or water? I'm like, no, I've had like 60 church members call and offer to bring me food and stuff. I'm fine. And we had a nice chat. And uh, they, he said, well, don't get tested for the next 90 days because you could show up a false positive even after you're over it. But I went after 10 days and got tested, and they said, I'm clear, and I'm fine. So anyways, I'm fine. I'm back in hugging mode. I'm okay. And so, um, but yeah, so that's, but one of the things, you know, we're, we're in a unique season in the world. The last year and a half have been a, such a unique and challenging time. And for so many people at different levels and different ways. And one of the things that has struck me is that in our world right now, with as, you may not have noticed it, but people are kind of polarized and people on different perspectives on things. It's not just like, oh, I think we disagree, but we're friends. People are getting really intense about stuff. And this is what has struck me again and again and again in the last year and a half. If Christians can show grace and kindness and forgiveness to one another and to other people in this season, we have a chance to shine a light in a powerful way. We should look different. And even if we disagree with people on things, and there's nothing wrong with disagreeing, it's how we behave, it's how we think and how we act. And so today we're talking about the forgotten art of forgiveness. And this is, this is a challenging topic it's one way, as a pastor, when you talk about forgiveness, there's, there's people who will get very kind of, kind of like, but if you knew, if you knew what I went through or what they did, you'd know why God thinks of all the people in the world I'm not supposed to forgive. But even though everyone else is supposed to, I, and, and it's, it's a tough year. So, so let's prepare our hearts to think about this, this kind of this forgotten art, because the idea of this series, the forgotten art, is that there's different ways that we can reflect the presence of Jesus by recapturing what he wants for us, what he wants for the world. And so we're talking about this forgotten art, and as I was thinking about this and preparing this series and working with our pastoral team, it struck me that some things with time, they change, and that's okay. I mean, there's just things that just change over time. It's not a big deal. For instance, and some of you might remember the 70s, some of the styles. I'll give you a particular style here. That some, this might bring a flashback for some of you. Um, and you might be wondering, you know, Pastor Kevin, are you old enough that you, that you own some angel flight pants or you own some, some discounts? And the answer is, yes, I did. And, well, did, you, did you have like the, the silk shirt that you'd button halfway down? Yes, I did. <laughs> did you have platform shoes? The answer is yes. <laughs> did you and your girlfriend take disco classes and go down to L.A. to some of the disco, I grew up in Orange County, to some of the discotheques and go dancing? The answer is yes. I did. Will I dance for you now? The answer is 
no, I will not. You don't want to see that. Uh, but, but there's some things that come and go, and you just kind of go, yeah, that's okay. No big deal, right? There's some things that change over time, and, and it's sad. Kind of for nostalgia, just for your, and there, there's some things that when they change, you have a moment where it's kind of a, it's a sad moment. You realize, God, the world's not the way it used to be. And I thought about that. I thought about where I grew up. I grew up, I was born in Newport Beach, raised in Huntington Beach down in Southern California. And Hunting, the Huntington Beach of my childhood was this undeveloped strip of sand. That's actually Huntington Beach. My friends would meet uh, between lifeguard, lifeguard stations three and five south of the pier. And for some of you younger people, I'll give you a perspective. When I was a kid, junior high, high school, I'm not recommending this, but like we would, I had like five or six friends and buddy, buddies of mine that we surfed together, and we'd get somebody's mom to pack us in their station wagon with our surfboards and our towels and cram all the kids in, drive us, drive us to the beach at first light, drop us off. They'd give us a dime. Remember, you know what that was for? For the telephone call. There weren't cell phones, right? I'm an old guy now, apparently. And they'd give us a dime. they said, well, call when you want to come. And we'd call at like five in the evening or seven or 10 o'clock. And somebody else's mom would come down with a station wagon, pack us up, and take us home. This is junior high. Different world, right? But, but, but now, I, I, I go down, whenever I'm down, I go down to Huntington Beach and hang out on the beach. But now, they're building these giant hotels. Nothing wrong with a giant hotel. But there's sort of part of me from my childhood that's just kind of like, Ay, I miss the simplicity and what the world was kind of like back then. There's some things that change. And you go, that's just kind of sad, but that's okay. But what we're talking about in, the, in these, the seven-week series is something's changed with time, and God wants his people to reclaim them. There's things that change in our world that are changing in our world. And it's not like, oh, it's just it's kind of sad, or oh, that's kind of funny. It's like, no, this isn't the way the world is supposed to be. And God's people are to follow the master artist and become his artists in the world today, where we show these things that reflect the heart of God. There's some things that, that God wants us as his people to reclaim and to live out. And, and if you watch our world right now, there's a lot that's changing very rapidly. So we're trying to address some of those things. So, so Pastor Dennis talked last week about the lost art of listening. And I listened to that sermon. I've been listening to people way better this week because if you weren't here last week, you've got to go online and watch the sermon Pastor Dennis preached because it was powerful. And it just showed me, boy, I don't like stop and say, how are you doing? And listen, it's like I move really quickly and I've got to slow down and hear. But there's a lost art to listening. Jesus, when there was all the swirl of people around him, if there was a need, he would stop and he would focus on one person and help meet them. He would listen to them and care for them. Read John chapter 3 and 4 sometime where you got Nicodemus and the woman at the well. Two different people, but he heard each of them right where they were at. And we need to reclaim that lost art. So if you weren't here last week, again, listen to that message. Today we're talking about the lost art of forgiveness. And we'll think about that together today, the, 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 the beauty of becoming like Jesus, who is the greatest forgiver of all. And learning to forgive like he forgave. The lost art of acceptance. Boy, that is a lost art in our world. We're afraid if we accept somebody, they're going to think we agree with them. And if we don't agree, we have to dislike them. That's not the heart of Jesus. Jesus spent time with people he didn't agree with at all about things, but he accepted them. He loved them right where they were at that moment. Jesus accepted me at 15 years old when I was a rebel and a hard-hearted punk. And he loved me right where I was. He didn't approve of how I lived, but he accepted me right where I was. And that's the heart of Jesus for the church. We're going to talk about that in the coming weeks. The lost art of blessing. The lost art of looking at somebody and saying, you know, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. To speak words of blessing and encouragement, that's a lost art in our world today. The lost art of hard work, of just, of just grinding it out and working hard. And, there's, and, there, and there, we'll look at the scriptures. Do you know that in perfect paradise, when God made perfect paradise, he put Adam and Eve to work. Work's a gift from God. We need a new perspective on that. The lost art of fellowship, of just being God's people together. Let me tell you today, there's such a joy to be with God's people today. I sang the first song in worship today here in the worship center with all of you. Then I went out and I sung the second song of worship out in front of the Jumbotron. Hi, everybody who's outdoors. There's a great group of people worshiping out there. I saw four or five people I haven't seen for a long time connected with them. So I sang the second song. And then I went into the family worship venue for the third song to sing along with the folks there. And then uh, if I could have come to your house where those of you at home, I'd have come there too. But I just, there's being with the family of God. There's something about it that God's designed, and it's kind of become a lost art for lots of reasons, especially all that's going on in our world. But we've got to reclaim these gifts. And then the last week of the series, we're going to have uh, the, the president and CEO of World Mission, who's going to be here to preach. 
And he is, he, this is an organization that brings the word of God in the most unreached places in the world, in, in, in solar-powered audio Bibles, these treasures that we, that we collect money for and send all over the world. And he's going to be coming here talking about the lost art of a heart for the world. The lost art of the church loving, not just ourselves and our church, but loving and bringing the gospel to the world. And that's going to be a powerful week. So th- this is what we're thinking about and talking about. And, and Lord Jesus, this is our prayer today. Our prayer is that you, will, that you will let our ears be open to hear what you have to say. Let our hearts be tuned in to receive what you want us to learn. And Jesus, let our lives be transformed. That even as you are the master artist that shows what every good thing looks like, may we become artists in this world showing the beauty and the goodness of who you are and what you've done. That following you means living in a different way that is so compelling and so beautiful It will draw the world in. Speak to our hearts today, we pray, in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're going to talk about the the forgotten art of forgiveness. And as we're going to do each week, we're going to begin, kind of the, the, the first movement is the master artist plan. What is God's plan when it comes to forgiveness? If you have your Bible, open to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. And in Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21, there's this account with Jesus and Peter and the disciples, but then it goes into a story that Jesus tells. And so in in, in Matthew 18, beginning in verse 21, we we see the account and then the story, and we know it's a parable because Jesus would say, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like this, and he's setting up for the story. And the point of a parable was to teach one kind of one big epic theological, biblical, spiritual truth. You don't break it down to every, you don't dissect a parable, you get the big picture. So I'm going to read this parable to you, and I want you to, in your own mind, answer this question, what's the big picture? What's the message of the story that Jesus tells about forgiveness? So let's pick it up in Matthew 18, beginning in verse 21. Then Peter, one of the disciples, came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, understand, in the first century, the Jewish rabbis had a saying. If someone wrongs you seven times, forgive them. If they wrong you an eighth time, eighth time, you no longer have to forgive them. That was a common saying. Seven times is like the maximum forgiveness. So Peter comes to Jesus and says, you know, he, he heard this saying going around. He said, should I forgive someone if they wrong me? My brother says, seven times? Like the most that a Pharisee would, uh, would a religious leader would have you do. And he, then verse 22, Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times, or you could translate that seven times 70. Now, the point is not 77 times or 490 times. That's not the point. What's the point? Peter says seven times, and Jesus goes, oh, way, 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 way more than that. And then Jesus, to make that point, tells a story. Please let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart as you listen to the story of Jesus. Verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began, to settle, uh, began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Now, scholars try to figure out exactly what that is in modern economy. But let me tell you what it is. It's 10,000 bags of gold. It's... Millions of money. I, I read some scholars that said billions in today's economy. The point is, more than this guy could ever pay back in 100 lifetimes, right? And he owes this king. Now, again, Jesus is telling a story to make the point. So what's the big point, right? He says that a man's brought to him, owes him 10,000 bags of gold. Since he was not able to pay, no kidding, right? The master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt, to recoup what he could. That was common practice in the ancient world. An entire family could be sold into indentured servitude to pay what somebody owed. So Jesus is using a familiar concept there. So you get the picture, right? Now, verse 26. At this, and picture this in your mind, the servant fell on his knees before the master, before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything, which obviously he couldn't do, but I'll pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him canceled the debt and let him go. All right? Story continues, verse 28. But when that same servant, that exact servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. What's the point there? A fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of what he just got forgiven, right? 
he grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees. See, this sounds familiar. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. Does that sound familiar at all? That's what this guy was just saying for when he got forgiven massive amounts more. Look at verse 30. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay back the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged. And they went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. And listen to the last line, verse 35. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. And so concludes the reading of God's word. Wow, right? It's like, okay, Jesus, make the point clear, would you? Uh, I think the center point, I think the key theme of this message is this. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Now, when we read a story in the Bible, we will oftentimes kind of can see ourselves in the story. And when I look at this story, I see myself in this story. You know, you know which character I see myself as? As the first servant. I think that's the right posture for us. To see ourselves as the one who has, if, if you've come to the cross, if you've received Jesus, you know that at that cross, all of your sins were washed away. All of your brokenness was taken. By his wounds, you were healed. Every word you've spoken, thought you've thought that you shouldn't have thought, everything you've done that you shouldn't have done, every, all the sins taken, and Jesus took them on himself, and he paid them all. 10,000 bags of our sin on Jesus washed away. When I think of the story, that's me forgiven by Jesus. And then when I go out and see somebody else who's wronged me, a fraction of what I've wronged Jesus, here's my question. Do I grab them by the throat and say, how dare you? Do I judge them, condemn them, refuse to forgive them? Or do I recognize the amazing grace of Jesus in my life and grapple with this difficult, painful, challenging process of learning to forgive? Because Jesus tells his story with absolute seriousness. Peter is saying, you know, how often should I forgive? Seven times? Jesus says, oh, way, 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 way more than that. Here's a story to make the point. So, let me ask you, if you're a follower of Jesus, have you been forgiven much? What has he forgiven you? What thoughts have gone through your mind that you know nobody else knows, but you know they've been there, and he's washed them clean? What words have you spoken? I've been, I've been married. My wife and I are pushing toward 40 years of marriage. I've had those moments where I, we're going at it about something, and I just, and I, and I, that words come out of my mouth, and when they're like out of my mouth, in the air, on the way to their target, I wish I could grab those words and stuff them back in my mouth, because then I see them land and hit her and what it does. And I've had a lot of times in my married life I've had to say to my wife, Sherry, would you forgive me? And my wife, as sweet as she is, she's had times she's had to come to me and say, Kevin, would you forgive me? I've had to go to my, each of my three sons at different times and say, you know, dad was out of line. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? I've done that. Neighbors, friends. I, don't, I can't have any relationship long, over a long haul where at some point, as a broken, sinful person, redeemed by Jesus, but still walking, walking this through this life, where I don't have to say, you know what, I'm sorry. This, this is part of our journey. And, and so Jesus is, is, is painting this picture, uh, this picture for us of you know, the master artist, the, is, is God Almighty, Jesus who walked among us, Jesus who gave his life to forgive us of all of our sins. Then you read Ephesians 4.32, and Ephesians 4.32 says this, be kind and compassionate to one another. Listen to this, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. 
How am I supposed to forgive somebody else? Just as in Christ, God forgave you. What was that like? Absolute forgiveness, massive forgiveness. That's the calling of Scripture. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. In Colossians 3, 13, we read this. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. I'll be honest with you as your pastor, this is not an easy one for me. This is one of the the toughest calls of God. To forgive people like Jesus forgave me because Jesus looked at me in my brokenness, in my rebellion, in my sin where I wanted nothing to do with him and he died on a cross for me. How's it going in forgiven? Man, I I just know, I can't speak for anybody else but myself but I can say it's a challenge. And so here's the picture I want us to have. That God's dream, the vision of God, God's dream is thoughtful, intentional, reflexive forgiveness. To think about it. To recognize, I've been hurt. This person's wronged me. I'm choosing intentionally to forgive. And I'd love it if someday I forgave just naturally, automatically. I'm not there yet. I gotta go through a whole process. Lord, help me first just not get angry or not want to retaliate. That's the first thing, right? And then, okay, Lord, um, you know, I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna know how to forgive like you forgave. And here's what we're so afraid of. Here's what we're afraid of. We think if we forgive someone, then what we're saying is what they did wasn't wrong. It, wasn't wrong. it was okay. If I forgive, then it'll seem like I'm saying it's okay. No. If you forgive by definition, they have sinned. The fact that you are forgiving means they've sinned. They're wrong. I'm just choosing to forgive in response to their sin, to what they've done against me, against somebody I love. Forgiving doesn't... doesn't you know, doesn't say it was okay. Also, here's the thing we worry about. If I say, oh, I'm going to forgive, if I forgive, I'm telling them they can do it again. I'm just opening myself back up again. No. You can forgive somebody and still say, but you know, I can't really be around you much. <laughs> you can forgive somebody and say, well, but we need a restraining order. You can, you, know, you follow me? I mean, you can forgive in your heart like Jesus and not tell them they can keep acting that way. Forgiveness is saying, what you did was wrong, what you did was sinful, and forgiving is saying that I am going to release it. I'm not going to let that imprison me with bitterness and anger and hatred towards you. I'm going to seek to respond like Jesus. And so I want to encourage you as a starting, and if, maybe if there's one thing you take from this message today, I hope it would be this. When someone has wronged you, when someone has sinned against you, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you are a Christian, if you're not a Christian yet, this will apply if you eventually become a Christian. But if, if somebody has wronged you, they've sinned against you, and you're a Christian, and, and, and your, your, your response isn't this reflexive grace and forgiveness, but it's defensiveness or anger or retaliation, that you would say, Jesus, I want to, and I would encourage you, just get somewhere quiet, get on your knees, and say, Jesus, just, I turn my heart and my mind to the cross. And just picture in your mind Calvary, the hill called Calvary. There's three crosses there. On the middle cross is Jesus dying for our sins. And the other two crosses are thieves. And remember that Jesus said to one of those thieves, today you'll be with me in paradise. He showed grace. On that cross, Jesus looked at the people who had driven the nails through his hands and his feet, and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When I can't forgive, when I'm locked up with, with my own bitterness or resentment or retaliation, if I, just, if I can just come before Jesus and say, Jesus, let me see the cross. Remind me that 10,000 bags of my sin were laid on you on the cross and you took every one of them and you took my sin and you took my shame and you took the punishment I deserved and you took the wrath that I deserved all on yourself out of love for me. And Jesus says, I fix my eyes on you and remember what you did on the cross. Would you let some of that fill my heart so that when somebody wrongs me, I can respond like you did. I can respond with forgiveness. This is one of the hardest things for a Christian to do. But if we can live this way, It transforms our lives, it glorifies God, and it impacts the whole world. So a question for you. What is your reflexive response when someone wrongs you? When someone wrongs you, what's your reflexive response? The second, the the, the servant here, when he went back out after he was forgiven, strangled you, give me back. Is is, is your, even though God's forgiven you, when somebody wrongs you, is it, well, you know what? They're never going to do that again after I take care of them. When they find out my wrath, 
You know, when they find out how I, you know, I, you better believe. You, you're going to bring that on me? You just watch what I'm bringing. I mean, this is the way of our world right now. And it's creeping into the hearts of Christians. Christians used to have a sense that, that we're the ones who forgive. But now in our world, if you're on the other side of the aisle from somebody, on you name the topic and whatever the topic, if you're on the other side of the aisle, if you're on the other side of the conversation, it's not just that people, you know, kind of, well, well, we'll disagree, but we'll be friendly. Uh-uh, uh, no, no, they're the enemy. And we'll talk about them, think about them, stew about them. If, if something bad happens to someone on the other side, man, we're, oh, yeah, they got what's coming to them. And where's the... Where's the heart of Jesus in that? Do we delight in somebody else's fall? Somebody who Jesus died for and loves too? Yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah, we disagree with them. Hey, to hate them? To refuse to forgive them? The Lord, help us. Of all the people who, who should shine the light of forgiveness, it's the ones who've had 10,000 bags of their sin placed on Jesus and washed away. So in those moments, I you know, just get on your knees and look to the cross and say, Jesus, remind me, remind me what you did, how you forgave. Remind me what I was like when you came to me and you loved me before I loved you. Well, they don't deserve it. They don't deserve forgiveness. No, no, and neither did we. If it was a matter about deserving, it wouldn't be forgiveness. Hello, right? We're for, it's forgiveness because it's not deserved. So check our hearts, Lord. And then movement two, the forgotten art. You know, the, the world has changed so dramatically. It, I think that Christians used to, to have a view of forgiveness. It's like, well, it's what we do. Man, that's, Christians, that's one of our specialties. <laughs> this is what we do. This, we get it. We get the forgiveness thing. We can, res, we can respond differently to other people because we've known God's grace. And, and, and it used to be when pastors would tell stories about these epic stories of forgiveness. People would listen and go, oh, yeah, that's beautiful. That's so good. I want to be like that. A pastor told a story about Corey Ten Boom. You know, Corey Ten Boom was held in, in, a, in, in a concentration camp in Nazi Germany. She watched her sister die. She was accosted and abused by the guards. And Corey Ten Boom, after she was finally released, traveled around talking about Jesus and forgiveness. And she had just given a talk on forgiveness in a church. She's standing outside afterwards greeting people, and a man walks up to her, and she recognizes him. He's one of the guards from that camp. And he came up to her, and he said, Fraulein, isn't it so good that God's grace is for all of us? And he extends his hand. And she says, she said her, her arms hung like lead at her side. She couldn't raise her arm. She said she just preached about forgiveness, and she couldn't. And she said she just prayed, and she said she felt the power of the Holy Spirit come down and warm her arm, and her arm just came up. She took this man's hand. We used to hear those stories and go, yeah, I want to be like that. Now we're like, what is she, nuts? She should make sure he gets a tribunal and gets judged and watches them die. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, the world is, you know, it, it's, people, you'd hear a story like Elizabeth Elliot, this amazing woman whose husband, Jim Elliot, went to the Aka people in South America to bring the gospel, and they killed him. So she went to those same people, learned their language, and taught them about Jesus, we see those stories go, man, what a, what a hero of faith. And I'm like, she did what? Why would she do that? They killed her husband. We, some, we have to be careful that our hearts have not become hard. Of all the people in the world who should be able to say, there is grace, grace, grace for you for whatever you've done. It's those who've received the grace of Jesus. Amen? We should be those people. But it's not always our first response. In our polarized world, it's getting worse and worse, I think. So a question, what do we lose when our reflexive response is to judge and condemn and not forgive? There's a lot of reflexive judgment in our culture right now. When we think somebody's wronged us or we disagree with them, it's like, well, we judge them, we condemn them. Tried, you know, condemned, executed. Just with my eyes, with my words, with my attitudes. It's like, wait a minute, stop. Get on my knees, look at the cross. How can I... How can I, who have been forgiven 10,000 bags of my sins, go to someone else and grab them by the neck and start to strangle them and say, how dare you? I mean, that's the heartbeat of this story. That's the heartbeat of Jesus. What if, what if Christians were to treat people who've wronged us like Jesus treated us when we wronged him? Because I think that's what we're called to. 
And can I tell you, it's torturously hard. I wish I could tell you my first response when somebody wrongs me is to go, oh, hugs and smooches, grace of Jesus, forgiveness and you know, abounding and plenteous. You know, my first response is, is, is like, okay, Lord, help me just not lash out. I've been a pastor a long time. I've been a Christian. I, I still, I think I've, I've gotten a little bit better over the years, but it's, it's hard. And they'll be, okay, don't, don't respond, Kevin, don't respond. Don't demand your justice. And just stop. And then to say, Lord, help me see things the way you see things. And again, forgiving doesn't mean we're telling people it's fine or they can do it again. And so what, the movement three is the picture's been marred. The, the, picture, the picture of Christians, God's people, being artists that reflect the forgiving heart of God. Something's gone wrong along the way. You know, what keeps us from forgiving? What keeps us from forgiving people? Maybe we say they, say they don't deserve it. You know, and we could say that they don't deserve to be forgiven. Well, that's the whole point of forgiveness. If somebody deserved to be forgiven, it's not forgiveness. We didn't deserve to be forgiven. And people have wronged us. They don't, they don't deserve to be forgiven except that God is gracious and good. And so, so they don't deserve it isn't a way out for us. Maybe we say I'm better than others or my sin is not as bad as their sin. You know, I, might have, I did some sins, sure, but it's nothing like their sins. Those are bad sins. Mine were just kind of little sins. No, be careful. Be careful. We all stand before God and only by the grace of Jesus. Maybe we kind of think that God loves sinners like me or people like me, but not so much like them. And oh, Lord Jesus, forgive us. God, forgive us. If we play the cultural game that says some group of people is better than any other group of people, we all stand, kneel before the cross as sinful people, every human being. And Jesus offers his grace to every single person with the same freedom and the same generosity and the same love. He does not, God does not make divisions between people. It's people that have come into his family and he delights in them. People haven't come to his family yet that he's inviting in. He doesn't drag, them, doesn't drag us in, but he invites us in. And, and we need to have the same heart of Jesus. So just a question to reflect on. Ask yourself, how have I been lured into attitudes and actions of unforgiveness? What's happened along the way? This made me say, nope, not going to forgive. Nope, not this one, not now, maybe not ever. As I think about that, I think about a couple who came to the church I pastored in Michigan, a retired pastor and his wife. And I love, I love pastors. I, love, I work with pastors all over the world, and I love encouraging pastors. And this retired pastor and his wife came, and they, the last church they served for about 15 years um, had treated them very, very badly. It was heartbreaking. I knew the story from other people. I knew, it was, I knew when they came, I thought, I'm hoping them coming to our church will be a place of healing for them because the church that they had left, they had, they had left with the church kind of, kind of almost kind of like sending them off afloat without, you know, like without financial support. They were struggling financially. They'd, they'd served their whole lifetime in ministry, and they were just kind of cut loose in a really, in a really bad way. So there was hurt. I mean, there was forgiveness needed to happen. But here's what I realized as I met this couple, and I can picture them right now, that the husband along the way had decided to forgive. And the wife had had committed herself to never forgive those people. Now, how can I say that? Because any time I'd preach on on forgiveness, she would be the first one up to me after the service. She would walk up to me and she'd say, Pastor, I will never forgive those people. I will never. And she would like, she would point at me. I'm like, whoa, I wasn't even there, you know. But she'd be like, she'd be like, you know, in my face. Just like, I I said, I'm just preaching the word of God here. But she was like, I, she said, I, and, but here's the thing. You could see it on their faces. Every time you saw them. He had a strength but a, a gentleness and a softness and a graciousness to his face. And she had this face of, you've seen it before, right, with people. Maybe you've seen it in the mirror with yourself, right, when you won't forgive. And there's this, 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 this look. And he had this, this gentle spirit, and she had this hard heart. And it was just, they were like these, and she carried it to her grave. She carried it to her grave. And I believe she went to see Jesus, and when she did, he, he wrapped his arms around her and said, you, you just didn't understand. I don't think that God got angry at her for that at that point. But I, I believe she knew, she knew Jesus. She loved Jesus, but she was so hurt, she couldn't let it go. I had a professor in seminary named Lou Smeads. 
an ethicist and a brilliant, brilliant guy. He wrote a book on forgiveness. And there's a line, and I can't remember who it's attributed to. I tried to find it. I did a little search, and I found a couple of variations of this line. But basically, it goes something like this. It says that, that when you refuse to forgive, you lock someone in a jail, you turn the key, and you leave them locked in with unforgiveness. And that person is yourself. It's yourself. You know, when you don't forgive someone, it doesn't hurt them. It destroys your soul. And this couple were this picture of one, they'd gone through the same experience. One had chosen to forgive, one had chosen not to, and they were totally different dispositions and outlooks on life and even physical appearance. And so we've got to make a decision to step into forgiveness. So movement four, reclaiming God's good gift. How do we, how do we step into this journey, at least of starting into saying, God, I'm open to forgiving. Let me give you three things that I think will be really helpful. First, and they're all kind of where you look. First, look at Jesus. You know, look at Calvary, see Jesus on the cross. When you can't forgive, just keep looking at Jesus and looking at Jesus, saying, Jesus, remind me what you've done for me. Remind me what you've forgiven. So focus on Jesus. And then second, look at myself. Look at yourself. Am I becoming that servant who's strangling others after I've been forgiven so much, am, am, I, am I that person who, when somebody wrongs me, they're going to get it back and twice as bad? You know, look at yourself and just, just be honest. And, you know, I can't, I can't do this in any of your hearts or souls. I can bare my soul to you and be honest. I'm learning and growing these things. I don't stand up as a pastor and say, I got everything mastered. Because I don't. But I'm working my way down that road. Will you look at yourself and say, boy, how do I respond? And does this look anything like Jesus? And can I, can I start to really say, God, open my eyes to see what you've forgiven me and to try to be more like you? And then the third thing, look closer at the person you don't want to forgive. Look closer at them because there's brokenness in their lives, even the worst of people who've wronged us. What have they gone through? What have they experienced? Because God knows their whole story and we don't. I shared this years ago. Um, one, of my, one of my most toughest moments to forgive came when I was a brand new, actually just, be, just becoming a pastor. I wasn't even ordained yet as a pastor. I was a seminary student going to school full-time and working at a church full-time. Church was paying me 100 bucks a week, 400 bucks a month, full-time work. And I went to the pastor every year, my mentor pastor, and I said, Sherry and I are really struggling. By my second year of seminary, Sherry felt called to leave teaching, which was our income, and she went to school full-time. So we had two full-time students, and I was making 400 bucks a month, and we were going to, every month we'd go into debt, 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 debt. So I'd go to the pastor, and I'd say, is there any help? Can the church help us financially? The denomination we're a part of, can they, do they do anything to help students of theology? And he said, nope, there's no help out there. Just learn to eat cold beans from a can. That's what he, that was his line, eat cold beans from a can. You couldn't even put, put, couldn't even put them in a bowl and microwave them, apparently. It was like, just eat cold beans from a can. And this happened for three years. And when I graduated, I was asked to be on the, on the student committee for seminary students that he had been on, and he had rolled off, so they asked me from the church to be on that committee. And at my first committee meeting, they said, okay, now there's the matter of the Zion Fund, uh, and so every student in any of our churches who's requested it, we give them $5,000 each year. Uh, if, they're, if they're in one of our churches and plan going into full-time ministry, we give them $5,000 a year. Both Sherry and I would have qualified for this every year. And I, sa I said to the guy in charge, I said, I said, I wish this was around the last three years when I was in seminary. He goes, well, it was. It's been around for like 15 years. When the Zion Church closed, they took all their assets, they put an account, and they made it so they could give it to students of theology. I said, well, I, I, said, I went to my pastor every year and asked him if there was any help, and he said there wasn't. And he says, well, that's really weird because he sat here and approved all the money for any other student who requested it. Now, that's a lot of years ago, and if I let, if I let myself go down a bad road, but, you know, I had to come before Jesus and, and look at this man who was my mentor, supposed to be looking out for Sherry and I. We paid for the next 10 years. We paid our monthly bill for school that we acquired during that time, money that, that, was, that could, would, would have just given to us. But, but I, and, and, and this guy's in glory. He's in the great cloud of witnesses in heaven right now cheering on as we run the race of faith. And I love that guy. And I saw brokenness in him. What he did was wrong. I think he sinned against me and against my wife. But I also worked with him for the next two and a half years and walked with him and just said, I, I, I got to choose. And now, I'm giving the Reader's Digest version. Was it easy? No. Was I angry and hurt for a, for a, a good long time? Yes. But I, I, had to, I had to say, Jesus, teach me how to forgive. I don't know what your journey is, 
But, but Jesus wants to grow us in forgiveness. And then movement number five, becoming an artist. I just want to ask you a couple of questions. Who do you need to forgive? Who's that person that you said, no, 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 no. Maybe start with somebody easier than them and you can work your way toward that person. But I mean, just who, who's someone right now that's wronged you? And you're carrying it in your heart, but it shows on your face and it shows in your spirit. And, and it, 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 you have a judgmental spirit towards them and you've forgotten how much Jesus has forgiven you. Who's someone you need to forgive? What's getting in the way? What's your belief system that, that allows you to not forgive? And maybe it's if I forgive, they're going to think it's okay. If I forgive somehow, um, I can't nurture this anger I have in my heart. And another question, what might happen if I, became, if I become a forgiver rather than a judge? What can happen if rather than us seeing ourselves as the judge and the jury and the executioner, we saw ourselves as one who extends forgiveness and grace as best we can where we are right now and keep moving down that road? Now, I want to say for some of you, the way that people have wronged you or hurt you, has, it, it's, it's, involved, it's involved maybe physical attack, it's involved you know, psychological warfare, it's involved deep, deep pain. And this isn't just like, oh, it, I'll forgive them, it's over with. There's things that you need to look at. I want to challenge you. If you're saying right now, I, mean, I, just, I need somebody to pray with me that I would just even want to think about considering forgiving. I'm not ready to forgive yet. I just want to be open to like say, Lord, maybe you can change something in my heart. We got teams after the service here to pray with you. If you ask them to anoint you with oil, they'll do that. If you ask them to you know, put a hand on your shoulder, they'll do that. And they will pray with you for God to work in your life. If you maybe need to forgive yourself, maybe you've wronged somebody and you're praying that they'll forgive you. If you want prayer, that's a confidential time to talk with someone who'll pray with you. Some of you say, I need, I need prayer. Yes, I need to meet with a Christian counselor or meet with a pastor and just talk through what I've, what I've been through and, find, and start this journey of forgiveness. And it, and it, and it, it may mean... Um, having to create some boundaries and work through some really tough stuff. We have, on our, on, our, on our team here, we have a man and a woman, both who are trained counselors who are available to church members, and they'll meet with you and help give you a reference. If you say, man, I, there's a depth of, of, of anguish, hurt, pain, anger, whatever it is, I'd love to meet with somebody. After the service, talk with Pastor Dennis or call this week and say, hey, can I talk with Pastor Dennis? And just say, Dennis, I would love to meet with somebody and start to walk through what's going on inside of me because it's, it's, it's going to, it's going to be a journey. It's going to be some work. We're here at that level to walk with you. If you say, I just wanted to meet with a pastor and talk and pray with a pastor. We're here to do that too. Uh, and, and if you're at home and you're not ready to come, and we'll, we'll, we'll meet you online. We'll do a video chat. We, um, it, it's, this is so important. And, and can I say, don't carry to your grave a hard heart, a bitter spirit, and a countenance that just says, I walk in anger all the time because I can't let this thing go. God wants, to, God wants to forgive them, but he also wants to set you free. And so open your heart to that and walk down that road. Will I hear the call to forgive others as God and Christ forgave me? Listen to these words again from Colossians 3.13. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. You, Lord Jesus, this is our prayer today. Wherever we are, some folks are just by the, alone in their home or with a group in their home. We have folks, in, folks out in the courtyard and in the family worship venue here in the worship center. But Lord, wherever we are right now, draw near to us. For we who have come to the cross and received you, Jesus, remind us of the greatness of your forgiveness and the price you paid. And I want to pray for you right now if, you, if you're saying, I'd love to figure out this forgiveness thing, but I don't really know the forgiveness of Jesus. You're saying to forgive as God forgave me in Jesus, but I haven't yet received that forgiveness from Jesus. I'll tell you, that's your starting point today. And if that's you, if you say, I, I just would like to know this Jesus who washes sins away, if that's you today, would you just hear these words? If you come to Jesus right now in prayer, say, Jesus, I accept your forgiveness. I believe that you are God who came to be among us. You died on the cross and you took my sins, you took my shame, and today I'm going to receive you. Would you just in your heart say, Jesus, I receive your forgiveness. I take all my bags and bags, my thousands and tens of thousands of bags of unkind words and thoughts and actions and deeds and whatever I've sins I brought, Jesus, I bring it right now to the cross. And Jesus, I ask, forgive me. 
Wash me clean. Give me new life and a new beginning. And then would you just tell Jesus, and Jesus, I want to take your hand today. And I want to accept your leadership in my life. I want to follow you and become more like you, Jesus. No matter how hard it is, no matter how long it takes to learn to grow in these areas, I want to be more like you, Jesus. So show me your forgiveness and then help me to live it out with others. And Jesus, for all of us, we pray that we would understand the greatness of your grace and your forgiveness and your love and that others would get glimmers and glimpses of you, the master artist, as we paint a picture of grace and forgiveness that this world longs to see, needs to see, and your people are called to bring. Give us the power to do this, we pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to stand with me as I send you off with a word of blessing. And I want to say, if you're new at Shoreline, we are so glad you're here. If you're online, just text the word welcome to the number you see there, and we want to reach out to you. If you're here on campus, anywhere on campus, just go right into the Connection Center right over here. They have a little gift bag they want to give you. They want to thank you for coming and answer your questions. If you prayed today and said, I want to... I need to know the forgiveness of Jesus and start walking with him. If you made that decision, if you're online, call the church this week and tell us, and we'll, get you, we'll send you a Bible and some information about next steps of growth. If you're on campus, again, go to the Connection Center and just say, hey, can I get one of those Bibles? Pastor Kevin said there's some Bibles here. Pick up one of those Bibles, and then there's some information you can fill out and just let us know. We want to come alongside of you and help you start a journey of walking with Jesus and growing in faith. Uh, also, if you want prayer, teams up here on this side over here, and over here, we got teams on both sides for prayer. And online, just call the number you see there or email and let us know. And we want to pray with you. Receive these words of blessing as you go from here. As you leave this place, as you wrap up at home, wherever you are, know the amazing grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. All your sins, all of them, if you've brought them to Jesus, are washed away. In that grace, in that power of the resurrected Jesus Christ, take your next steps into forgiveness. Paint a picture for the world to see that not only have we been forgiven by Jesus, we're learning to live like him and forgive others. Amen? God bless you. Have a great week, and I'll see you back here next Sunday. I get to preach the next three weeks in a row, and so I'm thrilled to be here. Pray that we all gather together again next week. God bless you. Have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.